So I haven't done a software review video for quite a while, like three years. But that's because I haven't really felt like I've had software that deserved a review. This thing, however, this one takes the cake. I saw this at our local used electronics store, uh, RePC, several months ago, and I immediately wanted to know just what was going on with it. Because you can tell right off the bat what this is. It's a boot manager, a thing that lets you boot different operating systems on one PC, but it's a commercial one. You'd pay money for this, right? And right off the bat, I'm sure some people are going, why? <laughs> why would you spend money on that? Because, you know, if you just install Linux, uh, it puts that little menu on your machine that shows up when you boot up that lets you pick different versions of the kernel if you've updated it. Sometimes you can even pick Windows from there, that sort of thing. That was in Linux pretty much from the get-go, and... This is pretty much from the get-go. This was sold back in 1999, or the copyright date. And at that time, if you installed Linux, you'd get a little menu on startup to let you pick whatever you wanted to boot to. So it seems weird that somebody would pay money for that capability, but hey, well, you know, we know how the market works, right? Well, here's the thing, though. You could set up Linux to boot multiple OSs uh, with Lilo or Grub, but it was a manual process, it wasn't super reliable, and it was really easy when installing a second operating system to uh, reboot and just find out that uh, that's all you had, that it had wiped out the first operating system and everything associated with it. This suggests that it's the safest and easiest way to add a new operating system. Guaranteed, in fact. That's quite a bold claim because I don't see really how it could promise that. When you install an OS, it's taking control of your machine at a pretty low level, so I don't know how anything could really make the process smoother or safer. But then it goes on to say that it automatically partitions on command, and when I saw that, I just had to have this. Like, what could that mean, right? Well, if we turn this around and take a look at the back, it kind of gets spookier. So here's the actual product. You can tell that's, uh, you know, a boot menu. Looks like Lilo or Grub with... Uh, I don't know, a bit more dressed up maybe. But there's an awful lot of OSs on here, right? Uh, NT, 95, 98, Windows 3, several DOSes, uh, Novell, OS2 Warp, Linux, SCO Unix. A number of those don't really like coexisting. So getting them all run on the same machine is impressive on its own. But also, typically, you could only install four OSs total because that's the number of partitions you could have on your primary hard drive. You could spill over onto a second drive, but it got complicated real fast. And even then, you know, this is more than two hard drives worth. So uh, there's some shenanigans going on here. Well, uh, this claims that it's going to protect our current OS while we add a new one and that it's safe, simple, and fast. And that in itself is a pretty strong claim because installing another OS for dual boot is not safe or simple or fast. So if this can actually make good on those claims, then it's gonna be a very impressive piece of software. But what does it say it'll do? Well, it says it offers an OS wizard, uh, which guides you step-by-step -step through the installation process and analyzes your system to determine the best hard drive configuration for your new OS. What could that mean? Right? Like, that, that just doesn't even really make any sense. But it claims that it partitions automatically and gives you the ability to add OSs without having to repartition your hard drive. Yeah? What would that be? And sure enough, if we look at the feature table down here, there's some spicy stuff here. Supports all PC-compatible OSs, inclu including Linux is. <laughs> I guess that's the plural. Uh, it also says that it allows multiple operating systems in the same partition? How would that even work? I don't know what automatic file management means. Uh, options changeable at boot time. Okay, that's actually interesting, right? Because, yeah, you could get uh, Lilo or Grub and install those, you know, dual boot for free, but you had to set them up by hand. You had to go edit these uh, text files to configure the thing, and it wouldn't automatically discover new OSs in a lot of cases. So if this actually has like a configuration interface, then okay, that could actually be worth some money. Uh, but then there's even stranger things down here. Multi-user password security. Yeah, what would that be? And then maximum number of OSs, 100 plus. Like not only is 100 OSs ridiculous, uh, but they're doing that thing where they say up to 100 or more. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, uh, creates and resizes partitions with no risk to your data. OS Wizard creates the best configuration for your new operating system. Universal mouse support. I have no idea what this thing is offering. Uh, it's not clear at all what function this would actually serve. And I'm incredibly curious to find out what the heck this actually is. Now, a funny thing about this is uh, I bought it partly because when I looked it up online, um, 
you know, every piece of PC software has been archived at this point. So uh, when I looked this up, I found that it actually had been preserved already on WinWorld PC, which is a pretty cool website that has virtually everything for the Windows platform. Uh, but they didn't have a serial number, so nobody could use it. So I thought, oh, okay, this was shrink-wrapped when I found it. Uh, it'll have a serial number in it. Uh, so I bought it, brought it home. I was going to image these discs just for fun and then uh, put the serial number up on the website. And then I looked at it again and found that somebody had posted the serial number in the comments. So, yeah, I'm, uh, I don't get to be a hero, but uh, hey, you know, I have it now, so <laughs> we'll still take a look. Obviously, we've got, uh, you know, reams and reams of paper in the box because this is a product from the 90s. And, of course, we've got the tome. This isn't nearly as big as some were, but, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not reading all of that. Sorry. <laughs> Don't worry. Nobody did when it was new, either. And, of course, we got the registration card with that all-important serial number that I didn't actually need. This here is the quick guide. Uh, this contains... Little sets of instructions for how to install each OS. But it's kind of redundant because it says these instructions will appear on screen and are just duplicated here for our convenience, so we don't need that either. Then we've got an important notice. Uh, extensive changes we made to your hard disk as you add a new operating system or use this product. Remember to back up your system first. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you were dual booting, like I said, the usual process was you install the new OS, then you find out all your data is gone. So you should definitely back up your system. You weren't going to, but you should. And we've got, of course, a little pamphlet for all their other products. Because, uh, of course, this company didn't just have one product. Some did, but this one didn't. So it seems like a thing they were really proud of was their partition tool. Uh, this was a really common kind of program back in the day. Uh, the most common example was Partition Magic. That was sort of the gold standard. And this actually claims that it does a lot more than Partition Magic. Look at all those check marks. Uh, of course, um, hmm... Partitions automatically, creates partitions for any OS. I don't know what either of those things mean. And also, undo partition delete and format, I think was a feature that already existed like in DOS tools. And I'm pretty sure Partition Magic could do that. So I feel like they're fudging the numbers a little bit here. And uh, the program itself, mm, doesn't look that impressive. So I don't know, but I don't have a copy. So maybe it's better than it looks. There's also, this is Deluxe Commander. This is what we already have. Uh, then on the other side, we've got a backup utility because everyone had a backup program in these days. I think pretty much every software company made one. So this is called Autosave, and it seems like the claim to fame is that it does continuous up-to-the-minute backups. Frankly, I'm pressing X to doubt that. <laughs> Sounds way too good to be true. And then the last thing here is System Commander 2000. Now, you may recall I said this one appeared to be from 1999. Uh, well, it seems like they were selling it for some time because this appears to be the next version of the software. It was already out when this was uh, sold. And per the description, yeah, it says it supports Windows 2000, which didn't come out until mm, 2000. So I'm going to assume this wasn't sold till 2000. Have I said 2000 enough? And actually, yeah, from the table here, it looks like they were selling these as different tiers of the same product. So there was a System Commander Personal Edition that sucked. Uh, I guess they just sold that with their Partition Commander product. Uh, SC Deluxe is what we have, and then SC2000 is what we'd have if we'd spent just a little bit more money. And then after that, we just have one more pamphlet here, an advertisement for System Commander plus Partition Commander. So I guess one ad wasn't enough. Pack in an ad for both of them at once. So that just leaves us with the disks. Um, we got disk one, installation. There's our all-important serial number. And then disk two, uh, which is used to restart an interrupted partition resizing operation. Well, that's terrifying. Uh, so I'm gonna image these and we're gonna take a look at them in a virtual machine. Now, I could do this on real steel. I certainly have enough old computers sitting around, but there's one big problem. They're old, so they're really slow and tedious, uh, especially when you mess up and have to do everything from scratch, which is gonna happen several times. So I will see you shortly in the virtual world. So I sat down uh, to start recording as I went through the process of exploring this thing. And as I went on, it just turned into more and more of a mess. Uh, so I just had to back off, spend a while figuring it out uh, and then take it from the top. And in short, I think this program was probably pretty disappointing to anyone who bought it. Uh, and this video is gonna be a hate fest. So I hope that's what you came for. We're gonna be using VirtualBox for this. Uh, that's a PC emulator, 
of a sort. Uh, it's not a very accurate one. It runs a lot faster than a, a period machine would have. Uh, and there's a few things that it just plain doesn't do right. Uh, for a perfect period accurate experience, I'd use something like 86 box, uh, which will actually emulate a Pentium 133 at the speed of a Pentium 133. Uh, the trouble is that's extremely slow and that's a lot more irritating. So I don't feel like doing it. And I think this is good enough. So to get started, we'll put in the disk for System Commander, uh, which I might call Syscom for short. Uh, and the first thing it does is ask if we have a boot disk for our OS. But of course, I don't have an OS installed, so I'll pick no. And it starts telling us that we we probably really should have one of those. It's, it's just a great idea. It doesn't really explain what this has to do with anything, especially since every OS already insisted that you make a boot disk right after you installed it. Well... The fact is System Commander uh, tries to act like what it's going to do is no big deal. You know, the, the back of the box says it'll protect your current OS while you install a new one. So this sort of implies that it's going to be a very safe process. This is not true. It's going to do a lot of wild and wacky stuff with partitions and OS files. Uh, and it doesn't really smooth over the misery of dual booting nearly as much as it implies. So you're going to hose your machine sooner rather than later. And this is their tacit way of saying that you shouldn't leave yourself in a lurch. So we'll move on from here. And it says that it needs a fat partition to continue. Now, I assumed that we'd be best off starting with a totally blank machine. It seems natural for like a system manager program, but the documentation assumes that you have an OS installed already. Uh, unstated presumptions are kind of a theme throughout the manual. Now you can install it if you just have an empty fat partition with nothing in it, but it actually confuses the heck out of system commander if you do that. So we need some kind of OS on here. And Okay, right off the bat, right, we haven't even run the program yet, and I'm feeling a little misled. If we take a look at the back of the box or the manual, partitions automatically. Where's the automatic partitioning? It's asking me to do it myself. That's not encouraging, but let's press on. I'll just install a copy of DOS and we'll keep moving. Okay, now we've got DOS on here. Let's put the syscom disk back in and try this again. Okay, now we get some options, and among those is one for manual partition. So it does have a disk partitioning tool. Why'd it need me to go use fdisk? Okay, let's go find out. We pick that, put that in, hit enter, and it crashes. Boy, howdy, this is looking like great software so far, isn't it? So basically, you need to install System Commander to your hard drive before you can do anything. Seems a little weird, but we'll go ahead and do it. I do want to point out one odd thing, though, before we continue. Uh, this last menu option here, your eyes might have skipped over that, but that says exit to DOS 98 prompt. What's DOS 98? Well, if we pick that, we drop to what looks like an MS-DOS prompt, but if you type DIR, that's not quite right. It's very similar, but those dates are four digit and there was no version of MS-DOS that ever had Y2K support. And uh, sure enough, if we type ver, it tells us that it's DOS 98 7.0. Uh, likewise, if we look at the files uh, in the folder here, there's no MS-DOS.sys, there's no command.com. Uh, and I showed this to some folks who knew more about disassembly than me. Uh, they took a look at some of the files and as far as we can tell, this is a bespoke OS compatible with DOS that uh, V Communications, makers of System Commander, VCOM for short, must have written from scratch uh, for some reason. As far as anybody can tell, they never sold it commercially. It's just here. So that's weird, but let's press on. So we reboot, we pick full install. It asks again if we have a boot disk. Let's just say we do. Then it asks where we want it installed. and. I had kind of hoped that it would live in some secret hidden area on the drive or something like that, but no, it just sits in your first fat partition. And this is concerning because the process of installing operating systems very frequently messes with the uh, MBR, the master boot record, uh, the partition table and the contents of the first partition. So it seems like it's gonna be really easy to render this unbootable. As it turns out, that's true, but let's press on. We copy some files, uh, once disk two, 
copy some more files. Uh, it sets a username and password. Um, you know what? I forgot to write anything about this in the script, but in short, uh, this is completely bogus. Uh, it's got this whole like uh, authentication system in here. You can make multiple users. They can have like permissions in the boot system and you can you know tell some people they can boot some operating systems and not other ones. It's all bogus. Uh, I mean, it's it's just a program running on the computer, right? So it's like those uh, those iPhone apps that claim to be like uh, super lock screens, but it's literally just it's just a program that's running. You know, if you just hit home, it goes away. Do they make those anymore? Maybe that's a thing from like 2011 that doesn't happen anymore. But at any rate, that's all this is. If you just you know put a DOS boot disk in the drive and reboot the machine, it's going to bypass all this crap. And uh, I read a couple reviews from the era that pointed this out, that it was just completely bogus. I have no idea why they bothered with any of this. Uh, and it's particularly funny because the manual uh, actually says that the security system is excellent, but that someone uh, with exceptional skills will still be able to bypass it. I'm just like, you mean, you mean like a nine-year-old who's ever seen you boot the computer off a floppy disk? I'm speaking for myself here. So then it says it's creating, updating the multi-fat file. Now, the manual doesn't really explain what this term means. Uh, it says that it allows you to install as many as 32 OSs on the same partition as long as they all support the fat file system. I don't really know what to make of that. I don't know what it means, but let's press on. So at this point, we're installed, and it now suggests that we read some notes about installing Windows. Okay, this sounds important. Now... I have to say, uh, from the description on the box and the first couple chapters of the manual, I pictured System Commander as something that you install on your machine and then it walks you through installing all the OSs that you want to have and, and that it's going to, I don't know, it's going to hold your hand somehow throughout all this pro I don't know, maybe, I, maybe it would replace the installer for, for different operating systems. You know, I could imagine that. It's not really like that, but at this point in the process, you wouldn't know that, okay? You've never seen the program before, and the box is pretty vague about what it actually does. So it's very confusing that they now want you to read all these notes about what happens if you ignore all of that and install your OSs manually. Now, I've read the whole instruction manual, and I've used this thing extensively. I have no idea what they're talking about here, okay? Uh, still, there's a lot of details about how the Windows 95 installer will delete your current DOS install, it'll replace your MBR, it'll delete Windows 3.1, uh, and Windows 98 will try to overwrite 95 and, and all this stuff, but like, why? Why is it telling us all this? We just installed the program, we haven't even used it yet, and it's telling us what happens if we, I, I guess, don't use it. Like, why? <laughs> The whole thing just comes off uh, like a forum post about how to root your Android phone. You know what I mean? All the like red colored headers and dire warnings about what happens if you do this thing or that thing. You know, you'll break your device if you stray off the beaten path and all that stuff. Uh, like this here, Windows Plus can destroy other OSs with the three exclamation marks. And the wild thing is, this is actually kind of an important warning, uh, which they utterly fail to convey. See, this is about drive space, which was a feature that was included in Windows 95, but it wasn't fully functional unless you installed the Microsoft Plus Pack. And what drive space did is it compressed your entire file system. And unsurprisingly, there were a lot of programs at the time that warned you to never use this thing. It was unreliable. It caused all kinds of problems with third-party software. So this warning comes as no surprise. You know, it, it says if you install a bunch of OSs on your C drive and then you compress that drive, then none of them are ever going to work again. I mean, I mean, duh but it says it in such a weird roundabout manner um in most cases these other os's will no longer work no it's all cases it's going to trash your machine and it goes on to say if you get into this weird situation like what what's weird about it you broke your computer uh then you can boot from a dos disk put in the syscom floppy and run the installer to restore it and then it might boot windows but not the other os's and it keeps talking keeps talking remember that system commander must be installed onto the non-compressed drive which will no longer be drive c at this point i've lost the thread completely i have no idea what the the, the non-compressed drive. why would there what the whole thing amounts to don't use disk compression, but they don't seem to be able to come out and just say that. In fact, the last sentence says, in general, we recommend against disk compression. I, I don't get it. Just say it's incompatible like hundreds of other programs did. Now, maybe you feel like you're losing the thread. I understand you came here to see the program, but we're off in the weeds nitpicking the readme. I mean, who cares? But that's just it. As a new user who just unboxed this thing, knows nothing about it, you're not going to know what you need to know. All you know is that the app is telling you to read all this stuff, and there's so much of it. It's just a wall of text. Your eyes are going to glaze over instantly. But 
if they just written drive space is not compatible with system commander and will render your machine unusable, we'd be done by now. And the user in 1999 would know a very important piece of information. Just say no to drive space. It's that easy. There's several more sections here that tell you the dire consequences of installing OSs manually. I don't know why when you're not supposed to do that. So let's skip all that proceed. And now it has advice in case we're installing or plan to ever install Windows NT. Again, we have never run the program at this point, and it wants us to read another wall of text. It turns out this is a series of dire warnings about, for instance, the disk management utility in NT corrupting partition tables. If you're still running version 3.51 for some reason, how is this their responsibility? This is a bug in Windows, right? It has nothing to do with System Commander specifically, huh? Okay, so we skip that, and next up we have another wall of text about OS2, uh, which yet again warns us about total disk corruption, so we'll bail out of that. And it now tells us that even if we are experts who never read the manual, wink wink, uh, that we absolutely must read chapter 3 in the paper manual, because every complaint they get is due to someone not reading that. So, okay, let's go for it. The first page tells us again to back up our machine and make a boot disk, which we've heard before several times. Uh, it then explains the basics of a wizard interface, which by 1999, everyone had seen, and certainly people who were dual booting their PCs. It then says it'll be assuming that we have Windows 3.1 installed and want to install Windows 95. H how many people still had 3.1 installed in 1999? I mean, again, we're talking about people savvy enough to bother dual booting, right? They all had Windows 95 on release day. Who is this for? Okay, next page. This is just four screenshots of the program with captions that describe the text in each screenshot, almost verbatim. Next page. Hey, look, it's another wall of text and it doesn't really tell us anything new. And what it does say is partly wrong. This last dialogue is apparently very important because the whole page is just dedicated to describing it. The three options on how to install Windows 95 are A, on top of Windows 3, destroying it, B, alongside Windows 3, or C, isolated by itself. These seem pretty self-explanatory, but no, VCOM insists that you need to read all these words that just say the same things in more words. The one thing we pick up here, though, is that if we choose the isolate option, then Windows 95 will end up in a partition by itself, while the middle choice will put both OSs in the same partition, making it harder to uninstall one of them later on. There's some value to that, I suppose, though it's nothing specific to System Commander, and I'm not sure it was vital upfront information. Uh, and also, as I'll explain much later in the video, the whole two last paragraphs here uh, seem to describe a program feature that doesn't exist. And that's it. That's our crucial information that we absolutely had to read. The rest of the chapter is just a reference guide uh, for the partition editor, which we'll apparently see someday, not that we can use it right now. Uh, and it doesn't even explain why you'd need to know about that now or ever. And I mean, again, isn't this all supposed to be automated per the box? Why would I ever need to manually partition anything? Again, I need to reiterate, I'm moving slow on purpose here because I want you inside the head of the person in 1999 who's just reeling, trying to understand why this program insists so sternly that they read this chapter in the manual. I mean, can you tell me now what was so important there? I can't. And you know, that's with 30 years of hindsight about computing. So rip to the poor bastard trying to make sense of this back then. But at long last, we're ready to boot the goddamn thing. So I'm going to take the floppy out. We're going to restart. And it's another wall of text. Is this a program or a novel? To be clear, this is a very specific kind of engineer behavior. Some types of computer programmers think that the only way to make users understand software is to front load reams of text, uh, just make them read, read, read all about stuff they've never seen, can't contextualize, and often redundantly. I mean, this is again telling me to use the OS wizard. The manual told me to do that. And it's telling me what'll happen once it detects my installed OSs and what'll happen if there's one of them, if there's two of them, if there's none of them. I mean, my dude, we'll find out when we get there. <laughs> it's the UX equivalent of someone giving you directions that are more about what you shouldn't do than what you should. You know, like uh, full of all these contingencies. You got to drive down Route 50, turn right at Granite Lane. If you miss that, you could turn right at Quartz Drive, then turn left to get back on the highway. And you're just going like, dude, just tell me how to get there. <laughs> if something goes wrong, I'll deal with it then. When you feed people all these ifs and buts and maybes up front, you're guaranteeing that they'll forget all of it or just lose interest and walk away entirely. But... That's enough complaining. We're finally ready to see System Commander in action. So 
We hit the button, it finds the DOS I installed, and it names it MS-DOS 6.22. So it actually detected which version I used. That's neat. And uh, yeah, here we are at the main menu. And despite the weight, I do have to say it looks really nice. I should mention briefly, this is actually running in text mode. Uh, these are not graphics per se. Uh, rather, this is using a technique where the VGA text mode character set is replaced on the fly with custom box drawing characters and icons. Uh, this makes it a lot easier to draw a nice looking user interface versus pushing all the pixels yourself. It was a pretty common trick in the late DOS era. The downside of it, however, is that the uh, full mouse support mentioned on the box just means that you can move the selection around with the mouse. You don't get an actual cursor. And that's fair. It was possible to make a cursor work with this technique, but it was a huge pain in the ass. I'm not surprised by this, but I was still pretty disappointed. So this is our boot menu. We can pick an entry by letter uh, or by using the keyboard arrows or the mouse. And by default, we just have the two options, uh, the DOS that I just installed and boot from drive A, which does exactly what it sounds like. Uh, this might seem a little redundant. If you haven't booted an OS yet and you wanna boot a floppy, then you can just put it in and hit control alt delete. But the manual explains that you can take the floppy drive out of the BIOS boot order so it doesn't waste time on startup every time checking for a disk. That'll knock a few seconds off your average boot time. And then on the occasions that you do want to boot a floppy, you just pick this menu item. That's fair enough, I suppose. And it does do exactly what it says. Now, naturally, there's a million options we could spend hours looking at in here. Uh, if we jump into the setup, for instance, you've got all these menus. Uh, if we get into the timeouts menu, uh, you can choose a default selection, pick an OS that it'll boot after a timeout, you know, the usual thing. Uh, that's a pretty ordinary and expected feature, but for some reason, you can also configure a sound to play every time it boots up. There's a whole bunch of these in here. They're all agonizing PC speaker screeches, and I don't know why anyone would want them. There's also a screensaver function, and that's pretty cute. As you'll see later, they drew a bunch of icons to represent different OSs on the menu, you know, Unix, DOS, Windows 95, etc. So yeah, uh, you might as well make a little screen hack out of them. Why not? The global options offers a whole bunch of overrides for different special cases, you know, like disable check MBR insertions and for OS2 and DOS partitions, skip fast boot. It's, it's all stuff you'd touch only if the manual told you to, but there is one neat feature buried in here. You can change the menu to a simpler flat style. Uh, you can see it's a lot higher contrast. This would probably have looked a lot better on monochrome laptop screens, which was still kind of a thing in 1999. And you could switch it to text mode, which looks almost the same, but it's no longer using customized character sets. Uh, so this would work better on machines that don't support that feature. There's a lot more customization here, all kinds of wild stuff you can adjust, and we'll see a little bit of it uh, as we go along, but let's start putting this thing through its paces. So the OS wizard is what this product is supposed to be all about. So we'll pick that and we get another wall of text. And now we're in what appears to be Windows. Except uh, if we pop into the about screen here, this says it uses DOS 4GW, which means this is a protected mode app running under DOS. It was pretty common in these days for sophisticated utility software, stuff like Partition Magic, to just rip the Windows interface clean off. Uh, apparently Microsoft wasn't too upset about this either because it was rampant. One of my favorite examples is a Cronus True image, which stole not only the entire Windows XP skin, but even its login screen, which they then repurposed as a boot menu to ensure total confusion in users. Like, remember, this is a system recovery tool, okay? So your uncle has like a compact and he hits F11 on startup by accident and he gets this screen and he's on the phone with you insisting that Windows is booting, he just can't get to his desktop. It would take you hours to figure out what the hell is going on like this kind of thing is literally why stuff like trademark law and design patents exist to prevent brand confusion okay i have no idea why microsoft has never taken a bite out of this juicy a lawsuit steak but i think acronis is still doing it but anyway let's go ahead and install an operating system uh, i'm going to start with a couple versions of dos uh, there usually wasn't much call for that back in the day but it's the lowest hanging fruit so we could do a new install a reinstall or a upgrade uh, we'll pick the first one and then dos ms dos all right now it's asking us a question that might be a little confusing to you 
Even if you have extensive DOS experience, if it's from this era rather than 10 years earlier, there's a good chance that you only ever dealt with it as like a single floppy that you stuck in the machine, you booted off of, and you did whatever you needed to do. And if you wanted to install DOS to your hard drive, then you just typed sysc, copied over whatever other files you needed, and you were done. But that was just the experience if you were using boot disks made from Windows. The actual MS-DOS product came in a box, on multiple disks and you couldn't really use it from the disks themselves. You were expected to install to a hard drive uh, and it had a whole guided install process. Uh, there was also a cheaper upgrade only version just like Windows had. So this is asking if we have the uh, full version, the upgrade version, or just uh, one of those Windows boot disks. Uh, I'll go with the full version just for fun. And now it asks if we want it together with other OSs or by itself. Well, the whole magic trick here is together with other OSs. So we'll pick that gives us a summary of what it's gonna do. And now it tells us that we're gonna reboot, and when prompted, we need to put the DOS install disk in the drive. All right, put disk one in, hit okay. This is the DOS setup program. Bet you've never seen this before. It's not a lot of settings in here, just date, time, country, keyboard, layout. Then it asks what folder we wanna put the uh, DOS files in. This is gonna be all the uh, auxiliary software, you know, format, F disk, more, QBasic, all that stuff. Disk two, disk three. All right, take the disk out and restart. Syscom detects a new OS and it offers us another wall of text. Once again, burying genuinely important information. Uh, you see, if we hadn't actually just finished installing a new OS, then this pop-up might be warning us that we have a boot sector virus, a thing that actually existed back then. Wouldn't it have made sense to maybe say that part first, you know, like maybe put some red text in there since this is actually important? No, no, I'm sure not. Let's. Let's press on. So it asks what we want to call it, and I'm just going to call it DOS 6. And then when I hit enter, it boots straight into the new OS. We get a prompt, and now we've got both of them in the menu. So we seem to have two copies of DOS as promised, but do we really? It's hard to say because they're the exact same thing. So I'm going to do it all over again, but this time we'll do DOS 5.0. So again, it asks what folder we want to install to, but it defaults to C colon slash DOS. Now this is the inflection point. Is System Commander somehow gonna make this work? Because we just installed DOS 6 into that folder. Surely if we hit enter, it's gonna overwrite it with DOS 5. But Syscom didn't warn us about this. It knows there's already a DOS there. It didn't tell us, make sure you pick a different directory. So let's just press on and see what happens. All right, we're done installing. Let's restart. It detects the new operating system. We'll call that DOS 5. I don't like the big long name. I just want DOS 5. And then it drops us straight into the new DOS 5 uh, and into MS-DOS shell. Uh, again, something that probably a lot of people have never seen before. Uh, for MS-DOS 4 and 5, it came with this program called MS-DOS shell. You can see exactly what it does. It's just a, a little like semi-graphical file explorer. And then for some reason, they stopped shipping it in version 6, which is what most people have experience with uh, at this point. So it's kind of a shame. It's a cute little thing. But at any rate, obviously the new OS is working. So let's reboot again. So there's our MS-DOS stub from the beginning. Here's the DOS 6 that we installed. Here's the DOS 5 we just installed. So they're all here. But let's jump into DOS 6 here, see if it boots. Okay, we're here. Uh, check the version, 6.22. So the core OS survived at least, but let's type format and incorrect DOS version. So yeah, it, it overwrote uh, the DOS folder where all the supplemental utilities live. And uh, I mean, of course it did, right? We told it to. I was hoping that System Commander would perform some kind of miracle here to make this work, but I'm not surprised that it didn't. So I backed up the hard drive before I did that. I'm going to roll it back and we'll try this again. So this time around, we're going to tell it to install to C slash DOS 5. All right, we'll restart again. This is working. So let's drop out of the DOS shell. Type format. Okay, that works. Let's restart. Switch to DOS 6. Type format. And that works too. So we now have two independent DOS installs on the same partition, exactly as promised. I had to infer how to make it work, but it does work. How, though? Well, if we look at autoexec.bat, we see that the path is set to C colon slash DOS. Now let's reboot into DOS 5. 
check the same file and it now says path equals C slash DOS five. So the files are being swapped out on the fly by system commander. And if we get into the system commander folder, we'll see that there are individual folders for MS DOS six, MS DOS five, and so on. So you can see exactly how this is working. Each one contains a copy of command.com, config.sys, and autoexec.bat. And when you start out, it just swaps out the files for whichever one you pick. Now, I'm pretty sure you could do the same thing with like a pair of batch files, you know, under just normal DOS. You'd execute one, you'd reboot, and presto, you're in a different version of the OS. Obviously, this approach has its advantages, uh, like a cleaner interface and the fact you can switch OSs even if your current one won't boot, and just an easier setup process. You know, I didn't have to write those batch files, I don't have to remember their names, and, and so on. But this is what we call a heuristic, a uh, fancy way of saying that VCOM looked at how DOS worked, figured out the minimum set of files that needed to be moved to switch versions, and then just wrote code to do exactly that. And the problem with heuristics is that they break if the underlying system does anything that wasn't anticipated. Uh, for instance, they accounted for the core DOS files, but not for those utility folders, uh, hence why we had to figure out ourselves how to install both copies at once. And with the incredible variety of software that modified DOS in incredible and unpredictable ways, I have to wonder how fragile this was in practice. In addition, there's more going on than we can immediately see. Besides the three files I already showed you, DOS also needs an msdos.sys and io.sys, two hidden files in the root of the drive. And sure enough, if we compare the ones in DOS 5 versus 6, the sizes and modified times change. So those are being swapped as well, but I can't figure out where they come from. They don't show up in syscom's respective folders, so some dark shenanigans are going on here. If we go back to the boot menu and then go into the file management section, this is how some of the magic happens. Uh, you can see those are our three files there that are being swapped out every time we start the machine and where they're coming from and where they're going. And you can actually modify this list. You can add uh, five more files here that are whatever you like. And there's the option to just delete a file or to uh, copy a file only if it's been modified, all sorts of stuff. But then down here at the bottom, there's these two copy operations that you can't edit. These seem to be hard coded for iOSys and msdos.sys, and it doesn't say where they're coming from. The source path is just the name of the file. Where are these being hidden? Well, I discussed this with some more knowledgeable folks than me and learned that io.sys in particular is a very special file that has to be located in a specific sector on the drive. Just copying it around isn't good enough and may have unintended effects. So probably syscom is storing the contents of those files in a database somewhere. And when you switch OSs, it directly writes the bytes back to the correct sector. That's kind of spooky if true, but at any rate, it seems to work. So let's press on. The manual seems to think that we should be starting with Windows 3.1, so who am I to argue? Let's go through the OS wizard and install that. Well, it says we don't need any help installing that, that we should just drop into DOS and just do it like normal. Okay, that's true. Uh, Windows 3 was basically just a program that you ran from DOS. You don't even really need to install it. You can just copy the files onto an existing drive, type win, and it'll go. But I don't want to add it to my existing DOS. I want a separate entry on the menu that jumps straight into Windows. That seems like a pretty common desire. So this message seems kind of discouraging, but we're actually on the right path. It's just not clear. If we hit next, uh, this will put us into the new OS install mode, and that'll give us a new menu item like we want. So let's just do this again. I'll have to make yet another DOS folder. We'll call this WinDOS, WinDOS 95. So that's installed, and we're going to name this Windows 3.1 on the menu. And then we just go ahead and put in the Windows 3 installation media. This is why I'm using VirtualBox. This is so much faster than doing it on real steel. Waiting for floppy drives. All right, that's all done. But uh, for it to start on startup, we need to edit autoexec.bat and just put win down here at the bottom instead of DOS shell. Now we'll reboot. There's Windows 3 on the menu, and there it is. So once again, System Commander is performing exactly as advertised. Uh, we now have four independent copies of DOS on here, one of which boots into Windows 3.1. It's pretty cool. I, I didn't know how to do that in 1999. But like I said, this is only slightly more sophisticated than you know stuff you could do with some batch files. Let's throw this thing a tougher pork chop, Windows 95. The manual is chock-a-block with these dire warnings about how Windows 95 will just trash your hard drive and how you got to be ready for all this stuff that it might do. So it'd be exciting to see what happens. 
I already know what happens, but hopefully it's exciting for you to see what's going to happen. So we go through the wizard again. We pick Windows, Windows 95, and now it asks which version of the disks we have. Uh, presumably it needs to know this uh, so it knows which files to move around behind the scenes. Now I normally use OSR2, also known as 95B, so I'll pick that. And now for some reason it says it's formatting something? Huh? That's unsettling. Once again, it tells us to reboot, and when prompted, we'll put the 95 boot disk in the drive. Now, what exactly was it formatting just there? Did it just wipe all my OSs for some reason? Let's take a look at FDisk and find out. Ah, see, what we're currently calling the C drive is actually a new partition. It created a second partition, formatted it automatically, and then manipulated the partition table to hide my original DOS partition so Windows 95 wouldn't see it and try to install to it. This is actually pretty clever, but what happens if we reboot right now, since the uh, original drive is not actually readable, as far as we can tell? Well, unsurprisingly, it boots right up because uh, System Commander's MBR code is smart enough to recognize its own partition, even if it's changed the type code to something that other OSs can't read. Uh, it also recognizes that there's no OS on the new partition that it made, uh, since we didn't finish the install, but I don't actually want to do that, since it didn't actually do what I wanted. Did you notice that we never saw the option to install 95 together with other OSs? I didn't notice this the first time I tried it, uh, but the question actually never appears in the wizard. I couldn't figure out why this was till I ran through it a couple more times. I pick OSR2, it never asks the question. I pick regular, it never asks the question. I pick upgrade, there it is. That's the question that we saw in the manual. I'm not exactly sure why it needs you to use the upgrade version, uh, and I don't think this is documented in the manual, but okay, let's give it a shot. I'll roll back the hard drive image and we'll try this again. So I picked together with other OSs, but the instructions here tell me to boot into my existing Windows 3.x installation. So I can't do this from DOS, apparently? What if I didn't have Windows 3.x on here? It never asked, but okay, whatever. It also warns me to not use the default Windows directory, uh, but to change it to uh, Win95 or something like that. So, yeah, they, they knew this was a problem. We'll make sure to put it in the Win95 directory. It warns me I won't be able to run any of my existing programs. That's fine. I didn't have any. We'll put in my CD key since I legally own Windows95. And she's off to the races, which in VirtualBox takes about five seconds. So after rebooting, Syscom detects a new OS, but it guesses that it's MS-DOS 6.5, a version that doesn't exist. That's weird. I'll rename that to Windows 95. And then it asks me what I want to call the new duplicate of the selected OS. I don't know what this means or why it's called Win98 prompt. I'll at least change it to 95, whatever this is. We move on and we get a non-system disk error. Huh. That's interesting. Let's reboot. There's our new entry. Pick it. Non-system disk or disk error. So this utterly failed. It didn't hose my hard drive, at least. I can still run Windows 3.1 uh, and the various DOSes, but the 95 install just doesn't work at all. I went back to the manual and read the section on this, and the instructions there seem completely different from what the wizard told me, uh, and they suggest I do a whole bunch of weird manual crap, so I did what anyone would have done in 1999. I ignored it, and as far as I'm concerned, uh, the claimed ability to install Windows 95 on a shared partition is simply a lie. Uh, even if it's possible to get it working, it doesn't look like it's worth the effort, and I'm certain it would be incredibly fragile. So that's not gone well, but we can at least try again with the isolated install approach that we started on earlier. I'm sure that'll work. First, however, we have to address a few problems that that had. So I've rolled back my hard drive again. Let's just uh, step through the first couple steps here. Okay, it just created this partition. Let's go ahead and reboot and take a look at that partition. We'll do this using that partition editor that was rumored on the back of the box. It does exist. Now, I find this layout a bit confusing. I would have expected the first partition to be on the top instead of the bottom, but maybe that's just me. At any rate, uh, the C drive, as it were, is this one labeled multi-fat. And again, I need to point out, I have no idea what that means. It's mentioned all over the place. Uh, here, it seems to imply that it's a unique file system, since the partition above it just says fat. But FDisk recognizes this as fat, and an unmodified DOS can read it. So this seems to just be fat with some weird marketing nonsense. 
Who knows what it's all about? Uh, at any rate, though, I came here to show you that the partition it made is two gigs, which is way too big. Instead of asking me what size I wanted, or if I wanted to make a new partition at all, uh, it just used half the remaining space on the drive, uh, which is extremely rude, so let's get rid of that. There's no delete button here. You gotta go up to the tools menu. It's probably so you don't click it by accident. Uh, and in fact, you have to do the thing the old F disk made you do and actually type the name of the volume to be absolutely certain that you mean it. Can't argue with that. Now, the second thing I wanna do is to shrink the DOS partition. I mean, two gigs is just way too big for, for DOS and Windows 3.1. Uh, and I should point out that resizing partitions was a dark art at this time. So this is actually pretty impressive. Like nowadays, Windows, Linux, Mac OS, they all have features for doing this. And usually you can actually do it while the machine is running, like on the operating system's own partition. It's pretty cool because I was there back in 1999. You couldn't do that. You had to buy a commercial app like Partition Magic and then run it from a boot disk. And even then it wasn't super safe uh, because resizing a partition isn't an easy task. You have to fully analyze the file system, uh, make sure you aren't leaving anything outside the new uh, boundary points. You've got to rebuild all the data structures. It's really arcane stuff and very easy to mess up. So it's kind of wild that Syscom just has a tool for this. It works. Come in here, we hit resize. We tell it what size we want. There you go, done. One gig is still pretty big, but it's a, a lot more reasonable. Uh, so I'd gotten this far while I was writing my script and I was gonna say, okay, let's make a new partition for Windows 95 now. And then I realized if I do that, then go back and run the OS wizard, it's just gonna ignore it and make yet another partition, right? Yeah, it's exactly what it's gonna do. So the only way to make this work, to get the partition I want is to let it do it automatically, make the two gig partition, install the OS, then remember to come back and shrink the new partition afterwards before I do anything else. That's, that's pretty rough, man. That's, you know what? That's worse than just making the partition myself in F disk the way you normally would. And I have no idea why it's like this. Obviously this company knew how to manipulate partitions. They could have just asked in the wizard how big I wanted it. Weird. So anyway, I'll run through it again. I'll let it make the partition. I'll install Windows like normal. Wants to install into C slash Windows and we're on a new partition, so that's fine. Put in the CD key for this copy of Windows, which I personally own. Definitely not typing this in off a website. All right, setup's complete. Let's boot it for the first time. And yeah, uh, iOS protection error. Uh, this isn't actually a syscom thing. Uh, this just happens if you try to install Windows 95 on a modern computer. But I figured I'd let you know, uh, if you're ever in this situation, all you need to do is run fix95 CPU. You can find it on the Google and it does exactly what it says on the tin. It fixes a problem that Windows 95 has with fast CPUs, uh, specifically any AMD faster than 350 megahertz or any Pentium 4 faster than 2.1 gigahertz. Why there's a difference, I don't know, although it is very funny. Uh, if you're curious why this is needed, uh, you can actually just read the readme here because it has the Microsoft KB article, Q192841, that explains it. And anyone who's used to retrocomputing stuff won't be surprised uh, because it's a timing loop. Uh, Windows used a timing loop to detect the processor speed. And since nobody imagined that processors would get a hundred times faster just a few years later, uh, it ends up dividing by zero because it runs so quickly. Uh, the same thing happens with a lot of old DOS software uh, due to a, a common bug in Turbo Pascal. Uh, and there's actually a one-click fix for that as well the more you know. Pick Windows 95, and this time around, it'll actually start. And then it fails to read the CD-ROM. This happens every time I try to install Windows 95 in VirtualBox, and always for different reasons. So it's just gonna fail to install the network drivers, but what else is new? So we'll restart, and of course we'll get a bunch of errors about missing files due to the CD-ROM thing, but after that, we're here at the desktop, and Windows 95 is working uh, perfectly for values of. If we open my computer, you can see what might be part of the problem here. Uh, for some reason, VirtualBox exposes four floppy drives to Windows 95. It doesn't do this to any other OS, just this one. Uh, and that pushes the CD-ROM up to like weird, unpredictable letters uh, that I can never find in the installer. Again, this has nothing to do with Syscom. I just thought it was really funny. But now that Windows 95 is installed, let's see if we can get back to our other OSs. And no, we can't. Uh, it just puts us right back into Windows 95. Uh, System Commander seems to be gone, uh, but for once, let's read the manual, and sure enough, it says that Windows 95 setup destroys the MBR. Uh, we just need to run check MBR from the install disk to fix this, and that appears to have reloaded Syscom. So let's reboot and find out. 
And sure enough, there it is. Uh, let's see if everything still works. Pick DOS, that's still there. And we'll pick Windows 95 again, and that's still there. And if we take a look at my computer, you'll see something interesting. There's now two hard drive icons. The second one is where all of our DOSes live. Because now that setup is complete, System Commander has put the proper tags back on the partitions, uh, so both OSs will now be able to see each other. Uh, but what's interesting is you can actually override this if you want. If we get back into Syscom and we go to the Options menu here, then go to Local Special Options. This one here, Primary Partitions Visible on Drive Zero, very clear and concise name, uh, actually tells us when we boot the Windows 95 menu option, which partitions is it going to be able to see? See, you can set this up so that if you've got four partitions on your primary hard drive, every time you launch an OS, it'll only be able to see its own partition and none of the others, or maybe one or two of the others, or all of the others. It's whatever you like. And uh, the point of that is to make it harder for the other OSs to, you know, uh, go where they shouldn't be, right? If you're really insistent that your Windows 95 think it's the only OS on the machine, then hiding the other partitions uh, will generally make it behave like that. But it's just a ruse, you know? I could set this to no partitions visible, boot into Windows, it wouldn't be able to see anything but itself, but if I just went to F disk, I could delete the DOS partition, or a virus could still wipe out my whole hard drive. Um, a copy of Linux could force mount any of these partitions as fat, you know? This is not any form of security, but you can imagine a lot of uses for it uh, that would be convenient, if not necessarily 100% reliable. And more importantly, I can't really think of any other way of achieving this in 1999. So Syscom does deserve some props. But let's be real, this still isn't really all that important a feature. Uh, most people would never have needed it. And besides weird edge case stuff like this, like I was saying earlier, most of what Syscom has done so far hasn't been much more advanced than what you could do with a few batch files. I mean, it works, more or less, but it feels like they're really doing the bare minimum. And there's no better illustration of this than if we install Windows NT. Windows NT, uh, we'll say regular, and it does offer the option to install together with other OSs. And getting NT, Windows 95, and DOS to coexist can be problematic, so this is what we want to see happen. So we pick that, and then it says, uh, boot into your existing Windows 3, 95, or NT installation, and just proceed with the Windows NT install process, uh, and that's it. Man, I don't know. I don't think that's going to get me what I want, but let's try it. We'll run Windows NT Setup, which runs at this uncomfortably low font size. There we go, that's a little better. All right, now it's running the setup. Oh, uh, and then VirtualBox crashes. It turns out if you wanna run NT4 in VirtualBox, you have to actually go into the settings and explicitly tell it that you have NT4 installed, because uh, otherwise it doesn't correctly uh, uh, hide the CPU ID leaf parameters or something like that, and you get this extremely funny crash. Let's try this again. There we go. So Syscom hasn't bothered to hide its own partition this time around, so it must believe that NT has the smarts to not stomp on the whole system. Uh, the second one here is the Windows 95 partition. It hasn't created a new one, so that's good, but I guess we're just gonna install over Windows 95. Uh, if we don't format it, then at least that shouldn't destroy anything, and it defaults to the WinNT folder, so okay. Uh, this looks like it's not going to destroy our 95 install, but it also looks like it's not exactly going to do anything special. It's just going to install onto the drive next to it like normal. Well, in reality, it's uh, simply replaced Windows 95 on the menu. And if we pick that, we, of course, just get Windows NT. But now if we restart again and then interrupt the NT boot process... Oh, would you look at that? There's an entry for Windows 95 at the bottom of the NT bootloader. And if we pick that, sure enough, it boots into Windows 95, a thing that NT already did by default. Like this is just, this is what happens when you install NT4 when you already have Windows 95. System Commander literally didn't do anything. What do you mean your work is done? You didn't do anything. Okay, here's what went wrong. When it told me to restart and boot from my existing DOS, Windows 3, or Windows 95 install, what it meant was boot an OS that's on the System Commander partition. I mean, it didn't say that, and I couldn't possibly have known that, but it turns out that this works. I rolled back, I reinstalled NT again, but I picked my DOS entry this time, and when I was done, I had a Windows NT on the menu that I could boot independent of everything else. So 
it, it seems like System Commander actually does deliver on a lot of its promises. I don't know why the shared Windows 95 install didn't work, but it really seems like they thought it would. So this seems to be some quirk in my setup interfering with it. And having dug into how Syscom works a bit more, it's actually doing more impressive stuff than I initially realized. That multi-fat term that keeps coming up seems to be VCOM's name for a technique where they monitor the partition that Syscom is installed on. And anytime it sees the boot sector change, it assumes a new OS has been installed and it saves that boot sector into a database file. Then when you switch OSs, it swaps that sector out before it chain loads to the partition. So it's not just moving autoexec.bat files, it's doing fundamentally deeper stuff. Uh, for instance, I tried installing a second copy of NT4 after the first one. It didn't work. Uh, I just got a second entry on NT's own boot menu instead of a separate one on the syscom menu. But it turns out that's not for lack of trying. It's just the new NT installs a boot sector that's identical to the old one. So syscom can't tell anything's changed. But if you've devoured the whole manual end to end, every word of it, you'll know that if you go in and manually run the syscom installer, go to special options and tell it to alter current boot record serial number, it will actually fix this problem. It turns out the system commander is actually quite a knowledgeable piece of software with a lot of capability. The problem is that its limitations are really poorly documented behind just all these walls of text to tell you all sorts of things you don't need to know. If you look at this from just the right angle, it's very impressive and useful, but after four days of working with it, I'm only just now getting how it wants to be used because the manual does a terrible job of explaining it and the software muddies the waters even worse. Why does the wizard say to boot your existing Windows install when what it means is boot the partition with System Commander on it? In fact, since it knows which partition that is, why doesn't it gray out the invalid options in the menu? <laughs> Every part of this product suffers so badly from UI and technical writing failures, like its usefulness gets buried under some of the worst communication I've ever seen. Everything is made so complicated that you completely miss the underlying simplicity of it. It's actually kind of tragic. Uh, and even after all this, Syscom still isn't everything it claims to be. All this so far has involved Microsoft OSs, and that's low-hanging fruit. Uh, they all were designed in the same ecosystem and mostly intended to work together. The box may suggest that there's a huge list of other OSs it supports, but everything outside the Microsoft garden barely gets acknowledged. And, you know, let's just talk for a moment about which OSs they claim to support. If we go back to the install wizard, hit next and click show all OSs, uh, there's an awful lot of stuff here. And frankly, I'm pressing X to doubt that they'd ever seen half of these. I mean, most of them do seem reasonable enough, at least. Uh, BIOS was still up and coming at the time. Uh, FreeBSD was definitely big. Uh, QNIX got forgotten pretty fast, but it was still a hot commodity in 99. Uh, and of course, Unix was still pretty much in full swing, although it was on the, on the downwards trend. Some of these might be a bit obscure nowadays, but like uh, Unixware and Solaris were definitely still relevant at the time. Uh, I'm not sure if Xenix was actually still in active development, but I can picture someone needing to run an old copy at least. But then like, uh, what the hell is Btron 1B or, or CTOS or Jexios, uh, Pick? <laughs> like there's eight names here I don't even recognize. And like, I'm me. At this point, I'm surprised they don't have plan nine on this list. Well, uh, Beatron 1B is apparently some utterly bespoke OS from Panasonic that I can barely find pictures of, uh, and which only came in Japanese, Chinese, and Korean, I think. Uh, CTOS is the Convergent Technologies Operating System. I've heard of that like once. I have no idea what it's for. Uh, it feels like some kind of mainframe relic, just reading the description. Uh, Jexios is a Java-based desktop OS from Toshiba. That one definitely went somewhere. Uh, and Pick OS is apparently some incredibly ancient thing that really was derived from a mainframe. Uh, for all I know, it's very interesting, but there's no possible way that I can think clearly about it, knowing that it was developed by a guy named Dick Pick. In summary, uh, the reason I don't know about these OSs is probably because about 100 people used them in total, and I doubt VCOM was among them. I mean, uh, here, check this out. If we go back to the setup menu, and then we go to the options, we go down to description and icon menu. They've got all these icons here, right? But if you flip to the categories, we've got DOS, OS2, Windows, Unix, and that's it, right? Like they do have floppy icons and BIOS and MBR for some reason, no idea what that's about, but 
that's the only OSs they covered, other than uh, for some reason they put Next, B, and 1B under the Unix category. I, I guess Next fits, but BIOS and 1B are not Unix OSs. And meanwhile, there are six icons just for DOS, so their priorities are pretty clear here, right? Uh, I doubt that they really thought anyone was gonna use most of those other OSs, and in any case, they don't seem to have specific support for literally any of them. Let's take Linux, for instance. Uh, this supposedly supports it, and it was a very hot property in 1999, so I'm gonna install Red Hat 7.2. That came out a little bit later than this version of Syscom, but it's easier to see what's going on during the install process than the earlier versions, and it's still pretty close to contemporary. So, we'll open the OS wizard, and we'll look for Linux, which isn't here, unless you check under the Unix category, which, uh, isn't encouraging as far as VCOM's understanding of what Linux is, but let's press on. Uh, it wants a boot disk get, which, uh, well, okay. This made sense for Windows 3 and Windows 95, which predated widespread support for the El Torito CD-ROM boot standard, but at this point, Linux disks mostly had it. Uh, all the ones I do uh, have it, so uh, you could just boot off the CD, but the System Commander manual makes no mention of this possibility and acts like it'll only boot from a diskette. Uh, and the secret is that once we hit finish on this, we can just boot from the CD and it'll work just fine. So we pick our system loadout here and then it wants us to partition the hard drive. Now, of course, if you didn't know Linux very well, you'd just be stuck at this point, but that's just how it was in 99. Nothing was automatic. Uh, we can see that Syscom went ahead and made a Linux partition for us, but we have to edit that. And what's going on here? I should be able to mount that. Why can't I mount that? What? There we go. We have to manually format it. Why did that happen? That's that's never happened before. All right, now this page is very important. This asks us where we wanna put our bootloader and the default setting will hose the machine. Uh, this would overwrite the MBR, which is where System Commander lives. And we'd have to boot from a floppy and run check MBR to uh, make the machine bootable again. That would fix all the other OSs, but the Linux partition would then be unbootable because there's no bootloader in the partition now. To fix this, we have to tell it to install grub to the partition instead. And this is actually spelled out in the system commander manual that you have to do this. But since distributions were all wildly different at this time, they couldn't give you specific instructions on, on how to do that. Now, again, is this syscom's fault? Well, maybe actually, like I had hoped that it would do some sort of magic to smooth over this problem, right? It seems like it'd be feasible for a uh, syscom to detect a Lilo or Grub image in the MBR and copy it to the respective partition so you don't have to choose this manually. But that would require a lot of specific effort on VCOM's part to support Linux, which I don't think they wanted to put in. Anyway, let's uh, zip through the rest of the process and I'll show you what I mean by that. 10 bucks if you can guess my root pass. Ah, damn, I gave it away. For some reason, if I let it install Mozilla, uh, it just crashes the setup, so we won't do that. All right, Linux is installed, and we can boot it from the menu here. And I corrupted my file system at some point. Oh, God, this looks like a mess. I probably hosed it. Boy, this really was Linux back in the day. Shut down one time, lose your whole FS. Let's see if it can boot. Hooray, we're booted. None of that was Syscom's fault. Linux was just a mess back in the day. Uh, so I can't get X working uh, in VirtualBox because uh, X in these days was really, really bad. So there's no graphics, but you can tell it's working. Hooray. But let me just reboot here and I'll point something out. If we pick Linux again, hey, look at that. Grub has DOS on the menu. And if we pick that, hey, would you look at that? It booted right into Windows 3.1. Uh, and if we had other partitions on here, Grub would have picked those up as well, because, uh, yeah, as it turns out, a bootloader with a graphical menu was not an exotic thing in these days. Probably a lot of people watching this are like, why would you pay $60 for a damn bootloader? <laughs> Grub was free. And okay, uh, it couldn't do the funky stuff with like moving, you know, config.sys's around. At least I don't think it could. Uh, and it was more tedious to set up, but you know, again, if you're the sort of person who's installing 10 OSs on their computer, probably you could figure it out, okay? And to go back to the earlier question, did VCOM build in anything like actual Linux support for this, other than having a button on the menu and, and the ability to name the partition Linux? Well, let's take a look at the partition manager here. It identifies that partition as Unix, so it doesn't know what X2 or X3 are, uh, and it doesn't have the ability to resize it. This only works with fat partitions. Uh, it doesn't work on Linux X2, X3, not on NTFS, not on OS2's HPFS, nothing, just fat. 
So I think it's pretty self-evident. This thing only cares about DOS and Windows 95. Now, I just mentioned OS 2, uh, and thankfully that's been dead for many years at this point, but was very sadly still in use in 1999. And the Syscom manual suggests that it has rich support for it, at least more than it has for, say, Linux. I mean, the partition editor still can't understand its file system or anything like that, but it does at least advertise the ability to install it alongside other OSs as long as it's on a fat partition. And the first couple times I tried this, it failed disastrously, uh, not because of Syscom, but because OS2 is a dumpster fire uh, that typically fails to install on any given machine. But while editing, I decided to try again on a whim, and to my great surprise, it not only worked perfectly, uh, but Syscom picked up the new OS, added it to the menu, and is now able to cleanly switch between OS2 and DOS. So yeah, it did it. But as it turns out, OS2 already had this ability. There's just a batch file included with the OS that, to no one's surprise, just moves a couple files around on the hard drive. So I have to admit, this does work, but it's still just not very impressive. It's something you could already do. Likewise, I installed an actual Unix variant, SCO Unixware, and that worked pretty much perfectly to my great astonishment. Uh, but once again, just in its own partition and with no specific support or assistance from Syscom. And I'm sure the same is true for all the other OSs they claim to support. They're just gonna show up as a generic Unix on the menu. So in the end, I just think the marketing on the box is misleading. It seems clear that, you know, everywhere they say OS on here, what they really mean is Microsoft OS. This can put 32 DOSs or Windowses on one partition, but for everything else, it's just a simple partition boot selector, which is really not very impressive even for the time. The box implies some then miraculous capabilities, but what it delivers is very ho-hum. And that's a shame because miracles were possible. Uh, Syscom may be limited to only FAT-based OSs, but at this point, people had figured out how to put Linux in a FAT file system by storing it in an image file, then chain loading it uh, with LoadLint. VCOM could have leveraged this, but they didn't, and that's another great disappointment. And this doesn't leave us with a lot of good things to say that don't have an asterisk next to them. I mean, I feel like I can see the outline of a really good product here. And honestly, I'm sure there were people who swore on a stack that this was actually terrific. If you simply read the entire manual and internalized every word and never made any mistakes whatsoever. Certainly those people existed in the Linux and especially the OS2 communities. Uh, those were OSs that exploded if you looked at them sideways and any attempt to do anything without having sat down and spent a whole hour researching it first would invariably just render your machine unbootable. If you're a person who doesn't ever do anything without front loading an hour of research, then this might not seem like a problem. And you know, you might have loved System Commander. The problem is that VCOM didn't make it clear that that's who this was for. What I see here is a technically competent program that solved a number of sticky problems in interesting ways, but oversold itself with all these claims of, of safety and ease. The fact is there was no way to rationalize classical BIOS MBR boot. It's a mess of a process. It's more grown than designed and every OS assumed it was the only thing on the machine. So they were constantly stepping on each other. You're just swimming upstream the whole time. But if you have a really thorough understanding of the platform and you're willing to spend a lot of effort carefully crafting a solution, then you can do a lot of remarkable things. But when you're all done, you have a house of cards. I know because back in these days, I knew plenty of people who did get nine OSs on the same machine without a special program like this. And it rarely lasted more than a couple months uh, before the whole thing blew up in their face after an OS update or something. But at least those people understood that that's what they were getting into. VCOM covered this box with promises of ease and safety that are just not true, in my opinion. And if this had been sold as an enthusiast product with matching documentation, I think I would have no trouble with it. But their attempt to dumb down an incredibly technical process uh, to make it sellable to everyday Joes just results in something that neither set was likely to find usable. Now, for what it's worth, I kind of suspect that this was supposed to be able to do more impressive feats, but then some stuff got cut. Let's go back into the OS wizard. We'll go through the Windows 95 install flow, but when we get to this page here, if we click the help button, this explains in greater depth, theoretically, what the options do. Uh, but what's interesting is it's wrong. Uh, see, it does say that if you want to install Windows 95 alongside Windows 3X, you can do that. We tried that, it didn't actually work, but whatever. But then it says that there's another option where you can have System Commander duplicate the existing partition uh, with Windows 3 and all your programs and everything, and then install 95 on top of the duplicated install of the OS. 
uh, so that all your programs are retained and so you still have a Windows 3 install you can go back to if you like. And this process is also mentioned in the manual. You recall when I was reading chapter three, I said that there was a paragraph that was just false. This is that paragraph. It says you can do that in there, but there's no way to do it in the UI and it's never mentioned again anywhere. Also, if we scroll down further, it lists uh, several options that also don't exist. I mean, the first two here are clearly just different names for the you know, stuff in the UI, but the third one, advanced custom install, that doesn't exist. And apparently that would have let me pick an existing partition. Uh, so I didn't have to do the silly, like create install and resize things. So it appears they were gonna offer a better flow and then they must've just rushed it to market and decided not to finish it. So I wonder how much else they didn't finish. And there is a way I could find out. Uh, I could run System Commander 2000. Uh, that came out presumably about a year later. And based on the single YouTube video that I've been able to find, it looks like they put a lot more effort into it. Maybe, maybe unnecessary effort. I'm not sure why it needs to look like an actual running copy of Windows 95, but at any rate, it could be better. Uh, the trouble is uh, it didn't fall into my lap in a sealed box. So I just went with the thing that I had. Maybe I'll look at that other one later. I don't know, but this is all I got for now. You know, I think it's been about three years since I did my last software review video because uh, they just balloon out of control. I mean, like you just saw, there's so much to explore. Uh, this one took me three days to shoot, if you can believe that, because I just kept finding more and more ways that the program didn't perform as advertised or had like hidden functionality. So hopefully that wasn't too plotting. Uh, and if you did enjoy it and you aren't subscribed, then consider subscribing. So I know you like this sort of thing. Uh, if you want to get notified when I upload new videos, then good luck, buddy. YouTube's not going to do that, but you could try turning it on anyway. Hope springs eternal. Uh, if you really enjoyed this, however, then consider supporting me on Patreon like uh, these, uh, someone on the screen is doing. I'm incredibly grateful for my patrons. I couldn't do what I do without their support since this is my sole source of income. Uh, and it's really hard as it turns out to fit things that should take an hour, but actually take three days into a schedule that includes a day job. I did it for years, it was miserable. So thank you to all my patrons for making this possible and everyone else, thanks for watching.